Ulysses 15, F, the sixth of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, F. Bloom. Pigeon-breasted, bottle-shouldered, padded, in nondescript, juvenile, grey-and-black striped suit, too small for him, white tennis shoes, bordered stockings with turnover tops, and a red school cap with badge. I was in my teens, a growing boy, a little then sufficed, a jolting car, the mingling odours of the ladies' cloakroom and lavatory, the throng penned tight on the royal stairs, for they love crushes, instinct of the herd, and the dark sex-smelling theatre unbridles vice, even a price list of their hosiery. And then the heat. There were sunspots that summer, end of school, and tipsy cake. Halcyon days. Halcyon days. High school boys in blue and white football jerseys and shorts. Master Donald Turnbull, Master Abram Chatterton, Master Owen Goldberg, Master Jack Meredith, Master Percy Apjohn, stand in a clearing of the trees and shout to Master Leopold Bloom. The Halcyon Days. Mackerel! They cheer. Bloom. Hobbledy hoy, warm gloved, mamma muffle red, starred with spent snowballs, struggles to rise. Again, I feel sixteen. What a luck! Let's ring all the bells in Montague Street. He cheers feebly. Hooray for the high school. The echo. Fall. The use. Rustling. She is right, our sister. Whisper. Whispered kisses are heard in all the wood. Faces of hammered dryads peep out from the bowls and among the leaves and break, blossoming into bloom. Who profaned our silent shade? The nymph. Coyly through parting fingers. There, in the open air. The ewes. Sweeping downward. Sister, yes. And on our virgin sword. The waterfall. Pula fuka, pula fuka, 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 fuka. The nymph. With wide fingers. Oh, infamy. Bloom. I was precocious. Youth. The fauna, I sacrificed to the god of the forest, the flowers that bloom in the spring. It was pairing time. Capillary attraction is a natural phenomenon. Lottie Clark, flaxen-haired, I saw at her night toilette through ill-closed curtains with poor papa's opera glasses. The wanton ate grass wildly. She rolled downhill at Rialto Bridge to tempt me with her flow of animal spirits. She climbed their crooked tree, and I, a saint, couldn't resist it. The demon possessed me. Besides, who saw? Staggering Bob, a white-poled calf, thrusts a ruminating head with humid nostrils through the foliage. Staggering Bob. Large teardrops rolling from his prominent eyes. Snivels. Me, me see. Bloom. Simply satisfying a need. I With pathos. No girl would when I went girling. Too ugly. They wouldn't play. High on Ben House, through rhododendrons, a nanny goat passes. Plum puddered, butty tailed, dropping currants. The nanny goat bleats. Bloom. Hatless, 
flushed, covered with burrs of thistledown and gorse-pine. Regularly engaged, circumstances alter cases. He gazes intently downwards on the water. Thirty-two head over heels per second. Press nightmare. Giddy Elijah. Fall from cliff. Sad end of government printer's clerk. Through silver silent summer air, the dummy of bloom, rolled in a mummy, rolls rotatingly from the lion's head cliff into the purple waiting waters. The dummy mummy. Far out in the bay between Bailey and Kish lights, the Erin King sails, sending a broadening plume of coal smoke from her funnel towards the land. Councillor Nenetti. Alone on deck, in dark alpaca, yellow kite faced, his hand in his waistcoat opening, declaims, when my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then, and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have bloom done. Proof the nymph. Loftily. We immortals, as you saw today, have not such a place, and no hair there either. We are stone cold and pure. We eat electric light. She arches her body in lascivious crispation, placing her forefinger in her mouth. Spoke to me, heard from behind. How then could you? Bloom. Pawing the heather abjectly. Oh, I've been a perfect pig. Enemas, too, I've administered. One third of a pint of quassia, to which add a tablespoon of rock salt. Up the fundament, with Hamilton Long's syringe, the lady's friend. The nymph. In my presence, the powder puff. She blushes and makes a knee. And the rest. Bloom. Dejected. Yes, Pekavi. I've paid homage on that living altar where the back changes name. With sudden fervour. For why should the dainty scented jewelled hand, the hand that rules? Figures wind serpenting in slow woodland pattern around the tree stems, cooing. The voice of Kitty. In the thicket. Show us one of them cushions. The voice of Flory. Here. A grouse wings clumsily through the underwood. The voice of Lynch. In the thicket. Phew! Piping hot! The voice of Zoe. From the thicket. Came from a hot place. The voice of Virag. A bird chief, blue-streaked and feathered in war panoply with his assegai. Striding through a crackling cane brake over beech mast and acorns. Hot, hot, where sitting bull? Bloom. It overpowers me. The warm impress of her warm form. Even to sit where a woman has sat, especially with devaricated thighs, as though to grant the last favours most especially with previously well-uplifted white sateen coat-pans, so womanly, full, it fills me full. The Waterfall Fill a full a pull a fuck a pull a fuck a pull a fuck a The Use Shh, sister. The nymph. Eyeless, in nun's white habit, coif, and huge winged wimple, softly, with remote eyes. Tranquilla convent, Sister Agatha, Mount Carmel, the apparitions of Knock and Lord. No more desire. She reclines her head. Sighing. Only 
the ethereal, where dreamy, creamy gold waves o'er the waters dull. Bloom half rises, his back trouser button snaps. The button. Yep. Two sluts of the comb dance rainily by, shawled, yelling flatly. The sluts. Oh, Leopold lost the pin of his drawers. He didn't know what to do. To keep it up, to keep it up. La 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 la. Bloom. Coldly. You've broken the spell. The last straw. If there were only ethereal, where would you all be, postulants and novices, shy but willing like an ass pissing? The ewes. Their silver foil of leaves precipitating, their skinny arms aging and swaying. Deciduously. The nymph. Her features hardening, gropes in the folds of her habit. Sacrilege! To attempt my virtue! A large moist stain appears on her robe. Sully, my innocence! You are not fit to touch the garment of a pure woman. She clutches again in her robe. Wait, Satan, you'll sing no more love songs. Amen, 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 amen. She draws a poniard, and, clad in the sheath mail of an elected knight of nine, strikes at his loins. Neku! Bloom. Starts up, seizes her hand. Hoy, Nebracada, catanine lives. Fair play, madam. No pruning knife. The fox and grapes, is it? What do you lack with your barbed wire? Crucifix not thick enough? He clutches her veil. A holy abbot you want, or Brophy, the lame gardener, or the spoutless statue of the water carrier, or good mother Alphonse, eh, Renard? The nymph. With a cry flees from him unveiled, her plaster cast cracking, a cloud of stench escaping from the cracks. Polly! Bloom. Calls after her. As if you didn't get it on the double yourselves. No jerks and multiple mucosities all over you. I tried it. Your strength, our weakness. What's our stud fee? What will you pay on the nail? You fee-men dancers on the Riviera, I read. The fleeing nymph raises a keen. Eh? I've sixteen years of black slave labour behind me. And would a jury give me five shillings alimony tomorrow, eh? Fool someone else, not me. He sniffs. <sighs> Rut. Onions, stale, sulphur, grease. The figure of Bella Cohen stands before him. Bella. You'll know me the next time. <laughs> Bloom. Composed, regards her. Passe. Mutton dressed as lamb, long in the tooth, and superfluous hair. A raw onion the last thing at night would benefit your complexion, and take some double chin drill. Your eyes are as vapid as the glass eyes of your stuffed fox. They have the dimensions of your other features, that's all. I'm not a triple screw propeller. Bella. Contemptuously. You're not game, in fact. Her sow-cunt barks. Right. Bloom. Contemptuously. Clean your nailless middle finger first. Your bully's cold spunk is dripping from your coxcomb. Take a handful of hay and wipe yourself. Bella. I know you, canvasser, dead cod. Bloom. I saw him, kid keeper. Pox and gleep vendor. Bella. Turns to the piano. Which of you was playing the dead march from Saul? Zoe. Me. Mind your cornflowers. She darts to the piano and bangs chords on it with crossed arms. The cats ramble through the slag. She glances back. Making love to my sweeties. 
She darts back to the table. What's yours is mine, and what's mine is my own. Kitty, disconcerted, coats her teeth with the silver paper. Bloom approaches Zoe. Bloom. Gently. Give me back that potato, will you? Zoe. Forfeits. A fine thing, and a super fine thing. Bloom. It is nothing, but still a relic of poor mamma. Zoe. Give a thing and take it back. God will ask you, where is that? You say you don't know. God has sent you down below. Bloom. There's a memory attached to it. I should like to have it. Stephen. To have or not to have, that is the question. Zoe. Here. She holds up a reef on her slip, revealing her bare thigh, and unrolls the potato from the top of her stocking. Those that hides knows where to find. Bella. Frowns. Here. This isn't a musical peep show. And don't you smash that piano. Who's paying here? She goes to the pianola. Stephen fumbles in his pocket and, taking out a banknote by its corner, hands it to her. Stephen. With exaggerated politeness. This silken purse I made out of the sow's ear of the public. Madam, excuse me, if you allow me. He indicates vaguely Lynch and Bloom. We are all in the same sweepstake, Kinch and Lynch. Dans ce bordel où tenons notre état. Lynch. Calls from the hearth. Daedalus, give her your blessing for me. Stephen. Hands Bella a coin. Gold. She has it. Bella. Looks at the money, then at Stephen, then at Zoe, Flory, and Kitty. Do you want three girls? It's ten shillings here. Stephen. Delightedly. A hundred thousand apologies. He fumbles again, and takes out and hands her two crowns. Permit, bravi Manu, my sight is somewhat troubled. Bella goes to the table to count the money, while Stephen talks to himself in monosyllables. Zoe bends over the table. Kitty leans over Zoe's neck. Lynch gets up, writes his cap, and, clasping Kitty's waist, adds his head to the group. Flory. Strives heavily to rise. She limps over to the table. Bloom approaches. Bella, Zoe, Kitty, Lynch, Bloom. Chattering and squabbling. The gentleman. Ten shillings. Paying for the three. Long me a moment. This gentleman pays separate. Who's touching it? Oh, my two. Pinching. <laughs> Are you staying the night? Or a short time? Who did? Stephen. At the pianola, making a gesture of abhorrence. No bottles? What? Eleven? A riddle. Zoe. Lifting up her petty gown and folding a half sovereign into the top of her stocking. Hard earned. On the flat of my back. Lynch. Lifting Kitty from the table. Come. Kitty. She clutches the two crowns. Flory. And me? Lynch. Hopla. He lifts her, carries her, and bumps her down on the sofa. Stephen. The fox crew, the cocks flew, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for her poor soul to get out of heaven. Bloom. Quietly lays a half-sovereign on the table between Bella and Flory. So, allow me. He takes up the pound note. Three times ten. We're square. Bella. Admiringly. You're such a sly boots, old cocky. I could kiss you. Zoe. Points. Yeah, deep as a draw well. <laughs> Lynch bends Kitty back over the sofa and kisses her. Bloom goes with a pound note to Stephen. Bloom. This is yours. Stephen. How is that? Les distraits or absent-minded beggar? He fumbles again in his pocket and draws out a handful of coins. An object falls. 
that fell. Bloom. Stooping, picks up and hands a box of matches. This. Stephen. Lucifer. Thanks. Bloom. Quietly. You'd better hand over that cash to me to take care of. Why pay more? Stephen. Hands him all his coins. Be just before you are generous. Bloom. I will, but is it wise? He counts. One, seven, eleven, and five. Six, eleven. I don't answer for what you may have lost. Stephen. Why striking eleven? Proper Oxyton. Moment before the next, Lessing says, Thirsty Fox. He laughs loudly. Burying his grandmother. <laughs> Probably he killed her. Bloom. That is one pound six and eleven. One pound seven, say. Stephen. Doesn't matter a rambling damn. Bloom. No, but... Stephen. Comes to the table. Cigarette, please. Lynch tosses a cigarette from the sofa to the table. And so Georgina Johnson is dead and married. A cigarette appears on the table. Stephen looks at it. Wonder. Parlour magic. Married, hmm? He strikes a match and proceeds to light the cigarette with enigmatic melancholy. Lynch. Watching him. You'd have a better chance of lighting it if you'd held the match nearer. Stephen. Brings the match near his eye. Link's eye. Must get glasses. Broke them yesterday. Sixteen years ago. Distance. The eye sees all flat. He draws the match away. It goes out. Brain thinks near, far. Ineluctable modality of the visible. He frowns mysteriously. Hmm. Sphinx. The beast that has two backs at midnight. Married. Zoe. It was a commercial traveler married her and took her away with him. Flory. Nods. Mr. Lamb from London. Stephen. Lamb of London who takest away the sins of our world. Lynch. Embracing Kitty on the sofa chants deeply. The cigarette slips from Stephen's fingers. Bloom picks it up and throws it in the grate. Bloom. Don't smoke. You ought to eat. Cursed dog I met. To Zoe. You have nothing? Zoe. Is he hungry? Stephen. Extends his hand to her, smiling, and chants to the air of the blood oath in the dusk of the gods. Hangende Hunger, fragende Frau, merkt uns alle kaputt. Zoe. Tragically. Hamlet, I am thy father's chillet. She takes his hand. Hmm, blue eyes, beauty. I'll read your hand. She points to his forehead. No wit, no wrinkles. She counts. Two, three, Mars. That's courage. Stephen shakes his head. No, kid. Lynch. She'd lightning courage. A youth who could not shiver and shake. To Zoe. Who taught you palmistry? Zoe. Turns. Ask my ballocks that I haven't got. To Stephen. I see it in your face. The eye, like that. She frowns with lowered head. Lynch. Laughing, slaps Kitty behind twice. Like that, pandy bat. Twice loudly, a pandy bat cracks. The coffin of the pianola flies open. The bald little round jack-in-the-box head of Father Dolan springs up. Father Dolan. Any boy want flogging? Broke his glasses? Lazy out of the schemer? See it in your eye. Mild, benign, rectorial, reproving, the head of Don John Commie rises from the pianola coffin. Don John Commie. Now, Father Dolan, now, I'm sure that Stephen is a very good little boy. Zoe. Examining Stephen's palm. Woman's hand. Stephen. Murmurs. Continue. Lie. Hold me. Caress. I never could read his handwriting except his criminal thumbprint on the haddock. Zoe. What day were you born? Stephen. Thursday. Today. 
Zoe. Thursday's child has far to go. She traces lines on his hand. Line of fate, influential friends. Flory. Pointing. Imagination. Zoe. Mount of the moon. You'll meet with a... She peers at his hands abruptly. I won't tell you what's not good for you. Or do you want to know? Bloom. Detaches her fingers and offers his palm. More harm than good. Here, read mine. Bella. Sure. She turns up Bloom's hand. I thought so. Nobby knuckles for the woman. Zoe. Peering at Bloom's palm. Gridiron. Travels beyond the sea and marry money. Bloom. Wrong. Zoe. Quickly. Oh, I see. Short little finger. Henpecked husband. That wrong? Black Liz, a huge rooster hatching in a chalked circle, rises, stretches her wings, and clucks. Black Liz. She slides from her new-laid egg and waddles off. Bloom. Points to his hand. That wheel there is an accident. Fell and cut it twenty-two years ago. I was sixteen. Zoe. I see, says the blind man. Stephen. Move to one great goal. I'm twenty-two. Sixteen years ago he was twenty-two too. Sixteen years ago I twenty-two tumbled. Twenty-two years ago he sixteen fell off his hobby horse. He winces. Hurt my hand somewhere. Must see a dentist. Money? Zoe whispers to Flory. They giggle. <laughs> <laughs> Bloom releases his hand and writes idly on the table in backhand, penciling slow curves. Flory. A hackney car, number 324, with a gallant buttocked mare driven by James Barton, Harmony Avenue, Donnybrook, trots past. Blazes Boylan and Linehan sprawl, swaying on the side seats. The Ormond Boots crouches behind on the axle. Sadly over the cross blind, Lydia Deuce and Minor Kennedy gaze. The Boots. Jogging, mocks them with thumb and wriggling worm fingers. Oh, have you the horn? Bronze by gold, they whisper. Zoe. To Flory. Whisper. They whisper again. Over the well of the car blazes Boylan leans, his boater straw set sideways, a red flower in his mouth. Linehan, in yachtsman's cap and white shoes, officiously detaches a long hair from Blazes Boylan's coat shoulder. Linehan. Ho! Oh, what here do I behold? Were you brushing the cobwebs off a few quibs? Boylan. Seated, smiles. Plucking a turkey. Linehan. Oh, good night's work. Boylan. Holding up four thick, blunt-ungulated fingers, winks. Blazes, Kate. Up to sample or your money back. He holds out a forefinger. Smell that. Lenahan. Smells gleefully. Ah, lobster and mayonnaise. <sighs> Zoe and Flory. Laugh together. <laughs> Boylan. Jumps surely from the car and calls loudly for all to hear. Hello, Bloom. Mrs. Bloom dressed yet? Bloom. In flunky's prune plush coat and knee breeches, buff stockings and powdered wig. I'm afraid not, sir. The last articles. Boylan. Tosses him sixpence. Here, to buy yourself a gin and splash. He hangs his hat smartly on a peg of Bloom's antlered head. Show me in. I have... A little private business with your wife. You understand? Bloom. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Madame Tweedy is in her bath, sir. Marion. He ought to feel himself highly honored. She plops, splashing out of the water. Raoul, darling, come and dry me. I'm in my pelt. Only my new hat and a carriage sponge. Boylan. 
a merry twinkle in his eye. Tupping. Bella. What? What is it? Zoe whispers to her. Marion. Let him look. The Pishogue. Pimp. Been scourge himself. I'll write to a powerful prostitute. Or Bartholomona, the bearded woman, to raise wheels out on him an inch thick. And make him bring me back a signed and stamped receipt. Boylan clasps himself. Here, I can't hold this little lot much longer. He strides off on stiff cavalry legs. Bella, laughing. <laughs> Boylan, to Bloom over his shoulder. You can apply your eye to the keyhole and play with yourself while I just go through her a few times. Bloom. Thank you, sir. I will, sir. May I bring two men chums to witness the deed and take a snapshot? He holds out an ointment jar. Vaseline, sir. Orange flower. Lukewarm water. Kitty. From the sofa. Tell us, Flory. Tell us. What? Flory whispers to her, whispering love words murmur, lip-lapping loudly, poppy smick plop slop. Mina Kennedy. Her eyes upturned. Oh, it must be the scent of geraniums and lovely peaches. Oh, he simply idolizes every bit of her, stuck together, covered with kisses. Lydia Dutz. Her mouth opening. Yum, yum. Oh, he's carrying her round the room, doing it. Riding a cock horse. You could hear them in Paris and New York. Like mouthfuls of strawberries and cream. Kitty. Laughing. <laughs> Boylan's voice. Sweetly, hoarsely, in the pit of his stomach. Ah, Gubleith Krak Brukar crashed. Marion's voice. Hoarsely, sweetly, rising to her throat. Ah, wish wash, kissing a puhis na puhak. Oh, wish washed, kissing a puhis na puhak. Oh. Bloom. His eyes wildly dilated, clasps himself. Show high, show plow her, more, shoot. Bella, Zoe, Flory, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Lynch. Points. The mirror up to major. He laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Stephen and Bloom gaze in the mirror. The face of William Shakespeare, beardless, appears there, rigid in facial paralysis, crowned by the reflection of the reindeer-antlered hat-rack in the hall. Shakespeare. In dignified ventriloquy. Does the loud laugh bespeaks the vacant mind. To Bloom. Thou thoughtest as how thou wastest invisible. Gaze. He crows with a black capon's laugh. <laughs> Yargo go. How my odd fellow choke it his Thursday morning. Yeah, go, go, go. Bloom. Smiles yellowly at the three whores. When will I hear the joke? Zoe. Before you're twice married and once a widower. Bloom. Lapses are condoned. Even the great Napoleon when measurements were taken next to the skin after his death. Mrs. Dignam, widow woman, her snub nose and cheeks flushed with death talk, Tears and Tooney's tawny sherry hurries by her in weeds, her bonnet awry, rouging and powdering her cheeks, lips, and nose, a pen chivying her brood of signets. Beneath her skirt appear her late husband's everyday trousers and turned-up boots, large eights. She holds a Scottish widow's insurance policy and a large marquee umbrella under which her brood run with her. Patsy hopping on one shod foot, his collar loose, a hank of pork steaks dangling, Freddy whimpering, Susie with a crying cod's mouth, Alice struggling with a baby. She cuffs them on, her streamers flaunting aloft. Freddy. Ah, ma, you're dragging me along. Susie. Mama, the beef tea is fizzing over. Shakespeare. With paralytic rage. We'd a seeker who kill a fast. 
The face of Martin Cunningham, bearded, refeatures Shakespeare's beardless face. The marquee umbrella sways drunkenly. The children run aside. Under the umbrella appears Mrs. Cunningham in merry widow hat and kimono gown. She glides sidling and bowing, twirling Japanesely. Mrs. Cunningham sings, And they call me the jewel of Asia. Martin Cunningham gazes on her impassive. Immense, most bloody awful demirep. Stephen. Et exalta buntur cornua uesti. Queens lay with prize bulls. Remember Pasiphae, for whose lust my grand old grossfather made the first confession box. Forget not Madame Gristle Stevens, nor the suine scions of the house of Lambert. And Noah was drunk with wine, and his ark was open. Bella. None of that here. Come to the wrong shop. Lynch. Let him alone. He's back from Paris. Zoe. Runs to Stephen and links him. Oh, go on. Give us some parlez-vous. Stephen claps hat on head and leaps over the fireplace where he stands with shrugged shoulders, finny hands outspread, a painted smile on his face. Lynch. Pommeling on the sofa. <laughs> Stephen gabbles with marionette jerks. Thousand places of entertainment to expense your evenings with lovely ladies sailing gloves and other things. Perhaps hers heart, beer chops, perfect fashionable house, very eccentric, where lots cocottes, beautiful, dressed much about princesses like a dancing can can, and walking there, Parisian clowneries, extra foolish for bachelors. Foreigns the same, if talking of poor English, how much smart they are on things love and sensations voluptuous. Mister's very select for his pleasure must to visit heaven and hell show with mortuary candles and they tears silver which occur every night. Perfectly shocking, terrific of religions, things mockery seen in universal world. All chic womans which arrive full of modesty then disrobe and squeal loud to see vampire man debauch none very fresh young with de soutre blanc. He clacks his tongue loudly. Oh la la, ce pif qui la. Lynch. Vive le vampire. The whores. Bravo, parlez-vous. <laughs> Stephen. Grimacing with head back, laughs loudly, clapping himself. Great success of laughing. Angels, much prostitutes like, and holy apostles, big damn ruffians. Demi mondaine, a nicely handsome sparkling of diamonds, very amiable costumed. Or do you are fond better which belongs they modern's pleasure turpitude of old man's? He points about him with grotesque gestures which Lynch and the whores reply to. Kachuk statue woman reversible or life size Tom Pete Tom of virgins nudities very lesbic the kiss five ten times enter gentlemen to see and mirror every position trapezes all that machined there besides also if desire act awfully bestial butcher's boy pollutes in warm veal liver or omelette on the belly pièce de Shakespeare Bella clapping her belly sinks back on the sofa with a shout of laughter an omelette on the <laughs> Stephen. Mincingly. I love you, sir, darling. Speak you Englishman, turn for double entente cordiale. Oh, yes, mon loup. How much cost Waterloo, water closet? He ceases suddenly and holds up a forefinger. Bella. <laughs> Omelette. <laughs> the whores. Encore. 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 <laughs> Stephen. Mark me. I dreamt of a watermelon. Zoe. Go abroad. And love. A foreign lady. Lynch. Across the world for a wife. Flory. Dreams goes by countries. Stephen. Extends his arms. It was here, street of harlots. In Serpentine Avenue, Beelzebub showed me her, a fubsy widow. Where is the red carpet spread? Bloom. Approaching Stephen. Look. Stephen. No, I flew, my foes beneath me and ever shall be. World without end. He cries, Parker, free. Bloom. I say, look. Stephen. Break my spirit, will he? Oh, merde, alors. He cries, his vulture talons sharpened. Hola, idiot. Simon Dedalus's voice hellos in answer, somewhat sleepy but ready. Simon. That's all right. 
He swoops uncertainly through the air, wheeling, uttering cries of heartening, on strong, ponderous buzzard wings. Ho, oh boy, are you going to win? Hoop, chat, stable with those half-castes. Wouldn't let them within a ball of an ass. Head up, keep our flag flying. An eagle jewels volant in a field argent displayed. Ulster king at arms, hi hoop. He makes the beagles call. <laughs> giving tongue. Bull bull, burble bull, burble bull, hi boy. The fronds and spaces of the wallpaper file rapidly cross country. A stout fox, drawn from covert, brush pointed, having buried his grandmother, runs swift for the open, bright eyed, seeking badger earth under the leaves. The pack of stag hounds follows, nose to the ground, sniffing their quarry, beagle baying, burbling to be blooded. Ward Union huntsmen and huntswomen live with them, hot for a kill. From Six Mile Point, Flat House, Nine Mile Stone follow the foot people with knotty sticks, hay forks, salmon gaffs, lassos, flockmasters with stock whips, bear baiters with tom toms, toreadors with bull swords, gray negroes waving torches. The crowd balls of dicers, crown and anchor players, thimble riggers, broadsmen. Crows and touts, horse bookies and high wizard hats clamor deafeningly. The crowd. Hard races, racing hard. Ten to one the field. Tommy, look right here. Tommy, look right. Ten to one bar one. Ten to one bar one. Oh, you're not bar. Steady, Jenny. Sell the monkey, boys. Sell the monkey. I'll give ten to one. Ten to one, bar one. A dark horse, riderless, bolts like a phantom past the winning post, his mane moon foaming, his eyeballs stars. The field follows a bunch of bucking mounts, skeleton horses, scepter, maximum the second, Zinfandel, the Duke of Westminster's shot over, repulse, the Duke of Beaufort's Ceylon, Prix de Paris. Dwarfs ride them, rusty armored, leaping, leaping in their in their saddles. Last in a drizzle of rain on broken winded Isabel Nag, Cock of the North, the favorite, honey cap, green jacket, orange sleeves, Garrett Deasy up, gripping the reins, a hockey stick at the ready. His nag on spavined, white gaitered feet jogs along the rocky road. The Orange Lodges. Jeering. Get down and push, mister. Last lap. You'll be home the night. Garrett Deasy. Bolt upright, his nail-scraped face plastered with postage stamps, brandishes his hockey stick, his blue eyes flashing in the prism of the chandelier as his mount lopes by at schooling gallop. Pervias rectas! A yoke of buckets leopards all over him and his rearing nag, a torrent of mutton broth with dancing coins of carrots, barley, onions, turnips, potatoes. The Green Lodges. Soft day, Sir John. Soft day, Your Honour. Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey pass beneath the windows, singing in discord. Oh, Jesus. Stephen. Hark, our friend noise in the street. <laughs> Zoe. Holds up her hand. Stop! Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey. Zoe. That's me. She claps her hands. Dance, dance. She runs to the pianola. Who has top ends? Bloom. Who? Lynch. Handing her coins. Here. Stephen. Cracking his fingers impatiently. Quick, quick, where's my auger's rod? He runs to the piano and takes his ash plant, beating his foot in tripudium. Zoe. Turns the drum handle. There! She drops two pennies in the slot. Gold, pink, and violet lights dart forth. The drum turns purring in low hesitation waltz. Professor Goodwin, in a bow-knotted periwig, in court dress wearing a stained Inverness cape, bent in two from incredible age, totters across the room, his hands fluttering. He sits tinily on the piano stool and lifts and beats handless sticks of arms on the keyboard, nodding with damsel's grace, his bow-knot bobbing. Zoe. Twirls round herself, heel-tapping. Dance. Anybody here for there? Who'll dance? Clear the table. 
The pianola with changing lights plays in waltz time the prelude of My Girl's a Yorkshire Girl. Stephen throws his ash plant on the table and seizes Zoe round the waist. Flory and Bella push the table towards the fireplace. Stephen, arming Zoe with exaggerated grace, begins to waltz her round the room. Bloom stands aside. Her sleeve filling from gracing arms reveals a white flesh flower of vaccination. Between the curtains, Professor Magini inserts a leg, on the toe point of which spins a silk hat. With a deft kick, he sends it spinning to his crown, jaunty hatted skates in. He wears a slate frock coat with claret silk lapels, a gorget of cream tulle, a green low cut waistcoat, stock collar with white kerchief, tight lavender trousers, patent pumps, and canary gloves. In his buttonhole is an immense dahlia. He twirls in reversed directions a clouded cane, then wedges it tight in his oxter. He places a hand lightly on his breastbone, bows, and fondles his flower and buttons. Magini, the poetry of motion, art of calisthenics. No connection with Madame Leggett Burns or Levinston's. Fancy dress balls are arranged. Deportment. The Cathy Lanner step. So, watch me. My Terpsichorean abilities. He minuets forward three paces on tripping bee's feet. Tout le monde en avant. Reverence. Tout le monde en place. The prelude ceases. Professor Goodwin, beating vague arms, shrivels, sinks, his live cape falling about the stool. The air in firmer waltz time sounds. Stephen and Zoe circle freely. The lights change, glow, fide, gold, rosy, violet. The pianola. Two young fellows were talking about their girls, 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 sweethearts they'd left behind. From a corner the morning hours run out, gold-haired, slim-sandaled in girlish blue, wasp-waisted with innocent hands. Nimbly they dance, twirling their skipping ropes. The hours of noon follow in amber-gold, laughing, linked, high hair combs flashing, they catch the sun in mocking mirrors, lifting their arms. Magini. Clip claps, glove silent hands. Carré, avant deux. Breathe evenly. Balance! The morning and noon hours waltz in their places, turning, advancing to each other, shaping their curves, bowing vis-a-vis. -vis. Cavaliers behind them arch and suspend their arms, with hands descending to touching, rising from their shoulders. Hours. You may touch my... Cavaliers. May I touch your... Hours. Oh, but lightly. Cavaliers. Oh, so lightly. The pianola. My little shy little lass has a waist. Zoe and Stephen turn boldly with looser swing. The twilight hours advance from long land shadows, dispersed, lagging, languid-eyed, their cheeks delicate with cypria and false faint bloom. They are in grey gauze with dark bat sleeves that flutter in the land breeze. Magini. Avant huit. Traverse. Salut. Corps de main. Croise. The night hours, one by one, steal to the last place. Morning, noon, and twilight hours retreat before them. They are masked with daggered hair and bracelets of dull bells. Weary they kerchy kerchy under veils. The bracelets. Hey yo! Hey yo! Zoe. Twirling her hand to her brow. Oh! Magini. Les tiroirs. Chaine de dame. La corbeille. Dos a dos. Arabesquing wearily, they weave a pattern on the floor, weaving, unweaving, curtsying, twirling, simply swirling. Zoe. I'm giddy. She frees herself, droops on a chair. Stephen seizes Flory and turns with her. Magini. Boulangère, les rondes, les ponts, chevaux de bois, escargot. 
twining, receding, with interchanging hands, the night hours link each, each with arching arms, in a mosaic of movements. Stephen and Flory turn cumbrously. Magini. Dansez avec vos dames, changez de dame. Donnez le petit bouquet à votre dame. Remerciez. The pianola. Best, best of all, barabam. Kitty. Jumps up. Oh, they played that on the hobby horses at the Miris Bazaar. She runs to Stephen. He leaves Flore brusquely and seizes Kitty. A screaming bittern's harsh high whistle shrieks. Grung grouse gurgling tofts cumbersome whirly gig turns slowly the room right round about the room. The pianola. My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Zoe. Yorkshire through and through. Come on, all. She seizes Flory and waltzes her. Stephen. Pas seul. He wheels Kitty into Lynch's arms, snatches up his ash plant from the table, and takes the floor. All wheel, whirl, waltz, twirl. Bloom, Bella, Kitty, Lynch, Flory, Zoe, Jujube, women. Stephen with hat, ash plant, frog splits in middle high, kicks with sky kicking mouth shut, hand clasp part under thigh. With clang, tinkle, boom hammer, tally ho, horn blower, blue green yellow flashes, tofts, cumbersome, turns with hobby horse riders, from gilded snakes dangled, bowels fandango, leaping, spurn soil, foot and fall again. The pianola. Though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. Close clutched, swift, swifter, with glare, blare, flare, scudding, they scoot, loot, shoot, lumbering by, barabum. Tootie. Encore, bees, bravo, encore. End of Ulysses 15F.